Well, good day to you. Uh, this is my third attempt. Uh, hopefully we'll get things to work. It's uh, not been a, an easy start for me today, but I'm gonna make an effort. Uh, and I'm gonna thank you because I know it takes time out of your day just like it takes time for my day to spend some time together around in uh, God's word. Before we do that, as always, I like to seek the Lord's blessing upon our time. So if you'll join me in doing that, please. Father, we come to the throne of grace. And I'm reminded when I, when I say that, that maybe perhaps in all English language for me, there may not be a sweeter, more pleasant word than the word grace. For Father, in that word, you communicate to me that everything I have in life, my physical life, but more importantly, my spiritual life, I don't deserve. I did not merit. I did not earn. And I certainly cannot repay you for the wonder of your grace, Father, and your mercy, in your love, all of which have been made manifest to us through the incarnation of your beloved Son, my Savior, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who willingly offered himself upon the cross of Calvary to be the once for all propitiatory, atoning sacrifice for our sins. Father, he suffered the horror of the cross so that we might, Heavenly Father, experience the heavenliness of salvation, the heavenliness of a personal relationship with you, the heavenliness, Heavenly Father, of knowing that we will be with you forever and ever and ever and ever. Thank you for the wonderful blessing of your grace to us through Christ. We ask this morning, this afternoon, this evening, whatever hour one might be tuning in, we ask Heavenly Father that that ministry of grace that comes through the Holy Spirit might be fulfilled. Might he speak forth his word with clarity, Father ignoring the instrument. Might he be the ears of the hearers to open hearts that we can truly see more of the care, the concern of your grace toward us through the person of Jesus Christ in the provisions you have made for our daily lives. Thank you in the Lord Jesus name, amen. I apologize once for the humming you hear in the background. I have waited uh, for some time to see if uh, he would stop so person doing landscaping work. Uh, and it's been going on now for uh, much, much longer than I had anticipated and much longer than landscape work usually takes. So I'm going to, excuse me, move something off my desk cleaner uh, for me a bit ago. We're just gonna have to listen to him hum in the background. I hope it doesn't interfere too badly. I've got a lot to cover and I'm gonna move quickly. There used to be, and it's, uh, I don't know how many years ago that the glass window stopped its uh, publication. This was a British publication. I mean, they had an, editor had an editorial section as most publications uh, do or did at one time. And in the editorial section, a man wrote this at a, at a, and was published in the editorial section of the glass window, quote, it seems ministers feel their sermons are very important and spend a great deal of time preparing them. I question the latter statement, but I hope they do. I have been attending church quite regularly for 30 years and have probably heard 3,000 of them. To my consternation, I discovered I cannot remember a single sermon. I wonder if a minister's time might be more profitable spent on something else. Uh, I have to tell you, sometimes I wonder if my time might be more profitable spent on something else for a variety of different reasons. But once this uh, comment 
hit the editorial pages of uh, the glass window, the paper was inundated for weeks, I mean weeks, with a storm of editorial responses. Uh, I mean, it was, it really was a storm. You, there were a lot of people who responded with anger, uh, other people responded in agreement, I and mean, you had this full-fledged, if you will, argument going back and forth between different people who, who read and responded to this original statement. It finally came to an end, this uh, storm, if we can call it that, uh, this bruja over uh, uh, what ministers do or don't do. It finally came to an end when one man sent this in to the glass window as a response. Here was his statement. He said, I've been married for 30 years. During that time, I've eaten 32,850 meals, mostly my wife's cooking. Suddenly I have discovered I can't remember the menu of a single meal. And yet I have the distinct impression that without them, I would have starved to death long ago. I have received nourishment from every single meal. I have received nourishment from every single meal. All 32,580 of those meals from his perspective, he that his wife faithfully prepared for him year after year after year gave him physical nourishment. I would venture to guess if he had stopped eating those meals along the way at any place along the way for an extended period of time, he would not be with us today. He certainly wouldn't have the health, at least enough health and capacity mentally to be able to respond as he did to the letter or to the editorial. All I'm going to tell you in disagreement with the first man, for those pastors who spend time in the word of God and work to prepare a spiritually nourishing meal that that work that those spiritually nourishing meals will serve to provide spiritual nourishment that will minister to the heart mind soul spirit of the new inner man and help the new inner man to grow spiritually, help the new inner, inner man to maintain sound spiritual health. Uh, the problem we deal with, however, is that, and I hate to say this, but I'm of the persuasion that many who serve the word of God or supposedly serve the will, word of God are not serving sound spiritual nourishing meals. Instead, we have false teachers, false teachers that we need to be aware of because instead of serving to you as a believer, the spiritual nourishment of the word, the unadulterated word of God might be serving you spiritual junk food. As I alluded to last week. Spiritual junk food. Now, I've come into this contact, and I'm going to give you an example of what junk food does to you physically. This is the same person, Drew Manning. Now, I know this is hard to believe, but this Drew Manning is a uh, coach, uh, I know there's a name for the for these these coaches that work with you, but a, a physical coach, a, a, a trainer, a personal, that's the word I'm looking for. Drew Manning is a personal trainer. Drew Manning decided what he was going to do just for a 30-day period, only 30 days, I think it was only 30 days, that he decided he, instead of eating the, the kind of nutrition that he had been eating and doing the kind of exercises he had been doing, he was going to eat nothing but junk food. 
That was it. Just eat junk food for a period of about, oh, 30 days. I think it was 30 days. So he, when I was looking at it in, in my notes, he ate high a high carbo carbohydrate diet, a high saturated fat diet, a high sugar diet, and a high salt diet. And this was the result. This is what he had. This professional trainer ate nothing but sugary cereal, soda, chips, white bread, white pasta, pizza, cakes, cookies, muffins, just to see what would happen. That's the result. This is what happened to Drew Manning's physical body. Uh, imagine what happens to a spiritual, the spiritual man, if we feed him nothing but junk food like Drew Manning did for this 30 day period, or maybe it was longer than that. It was longer than 30 days, it was 23 weeks. That's what it was, 23 weeks. But here's what a junk food diet can lead to, physical. Decreased energy and focus, bloating, reactive hypoglycemia, reactive hypoglycemia, acid reflux and indigestion, poor sleep. Didn't know that one because I don't sleep poorly. Obesity, type two diabetes, depression, digestive issues teeth and bone issues, all from a junk food diet. Heart disease was no surprise. Stroke, cancer. I didn't know that spiritual junk, or spirit, the junk food had, could have a, it could lead to cancer, but it can. Liver disease, early death. All of these things can come about by eating a junk food, diet, this is what can happen to the physical body. Well, if we do nothing but feed the inner man, and again, I, I love junk food. I, I tell you I do. I'm looking at this thing, the picture of all these kinds of junk foods that change the body of Drew Manning from a, 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 a wonderfully built physique to what we saw in the other picture. I love all of these things. There's not a single thing there I don't love. But I have, by God's grace, enough common sense to know this diet is not good for me. So I avoid an overindulgence in junk food as much as I might love it. And this is why you and all believers need to beware of false teachers because that's what they want to feed you. Now, I come into this intersection with false teachers because I was dealing with things that believers are either to do, to know, to be aware of in order to protect themselves against the deception of the sin nature. And you have to be aware of the alluring appeal of desires of the sin nature for ear-tickling spiritual junk food. The, the, the old nature likes ear tickling spiritual junk food, at least the old nature of many, not all, but many like ear tickling spiritual junk food. And as I said last week, if there is something people want, trust me, there will be somebody there to try and meet that desire. And because believers and unbelievers love ear tickling spiritual junk food as prompted by the sin nature. There are plenty of false teachers out there today who will mix modern man's thinking with the word of God, proclaim a message, and I call these the uh, their message, the A message. It comes from the P boys, and here's why that will appease, that will appeal to, allure, appease, seem appropriate to the natural man's thinking and his sin nature's fleshly desires for prosperity, physical wellness, personal happiness, physical pleasures, and the placing of his or her personal wants. And this is what the false teachers are gonna offer you. All of these things, placing his, her personal wants above the desires to please 
and honor the Lord, as well as using pretentious religious pomposity that will be void of genuine spiritual truth or genuine spiritual reality. And what's void of genuine spiritual reality mean? That it's that which is not theocentric, that which is not focused on God, and that which does not glorify God is void of general, genuine spiritual reality. That which does is anthropocentric, that which does focus on man, that which does elevate man, is not genuine spiritual reality. And these men may use methods, women may use wet methods, which have the appearance of the miraculous, all of which promote modern forms of idolatry, which we have hammered and hammered. So when I got to this section, this beware of false teachers, I, I could see it was a a huge section uh, from the scripture decided to set this in an outline by itself. And I started with the very first point, warnings to beware. Warnings to beware of false teachers. I finished one of the 10 warnings of Jesus. I'm about half the way through one of the several warnings of the apostle Paul that I've listed, and that is his warning to the elders at Ephesus. And I'm looking at the sixth point, moving down to that, and that is the duties of the elders at Ephesus. We read in Acts 20 at 28, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit hath made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. So we are looking at continuing on more of the second duty of the elders and understand this is the Holy Spirit's purpose. And if, if the elder isn't doing this, he isn't working in accordance with the purpose of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had a purpose for placing every elder that he's placed in the body of Christ, true elders that he has placed. The elders he has placed in the body of Christ are to function as overseers to shepherd and that is the best meaning of the Greek word poimino, as I have covered. And now to a third thing concerning the work of the shepherd, which I started last week. And really, I have my classes out of order. I should have taught this one before last week's. I got my notes scrambled up a bit. I apologize. But I don't think in the final uh, readout it makes much difference because they're saying this, uh, expanding, elaborating on the same spiritual truth. That is that the work of the shepherd included keeping the sheep healthy. I did not touch upon that last week. I went to the Timothy passage pretty much straight away. So here is one place from the scripture we can see that it is, was the responsibility of the literal physical shepherd to keep the sheep that they were responsible for healthy. And the Lord uses this to explain explain the relationship, what's happening among the people of Israel at the present time. And so the word of the Lord came unto me, and that is the prophet Ezekiel, saying, Ezekiel 34, 1, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel, prophesy and say unto them. Now, prophesy here does not mean to foretell the future in this case. Prophesy is talking about this simply declare God's word, this is relative to the current situation, circumstances that are happening, and say unto them, thus saith the Lord unto the shepherds of Israel, notice that it's current, that do feed themselves, rhetorical question, should not the shepherds feed the flocks? The answer to the rhetorical question, any Israelite in that day and is, of course, it's a responsibility of shepherds to feed the flocks. But the shepherds of Israel, shepherds here denote the leaders of the people of Israel. Their leaders had a responsibility. Responsibility included feeding the flocks, Ezekiel 34, 2. Ye eat the fat. By the fat, he means the best portion. You're taking uh, the, the cream off of the top, and you clothe yourselves with wool. Ye kill those who are fed, but ye feed not the flock. You're not doing what shepherds are supposed to do. You're not shepherding the flock. Verse 3. Now to verse 4. What are you not doing? 
The diseased have you not strengthened. Neither have you healed that which was sick. Neither have you bound up that which was broken. Neither have you brought again that which was driven away. Neither have you sought that which was lost. But with force and cruelty, and this tells us you're pointing to their leaders, have ye ruled them. You see, the shepherds of Israel, their leaders were not doing what they were supposed to do. And the Lord uses the analogy of the shepherd to express what they were not doing. He is calling out the leaders of Israel as shepherds in verse 4 who were not tending to the physical health of the sheep. And then a verse, we move on, and in, I guess I got, do I have them up here? Yeah, verse 16, notice what the Lord says. I will seek that which was lost and bring again that which was driven away and will bind up that which was broken, that which needed health care and will strengthen that which was sick, that which would needed health care. Why would the Lord do that? Because the Lord is the good shepherd. And it is the responsibility of the shepherd to provide spiritual health care for the flock. It was his responsibility to, to take care of them when it came to their health. And then here's what's coming to the shepherds of Israel, the leaders. But I will destroy the fat and the strong. I will feed them with justice. He's going to feed them with justice because as he calls out the leaders of Israel, Shepherds who are not tending to the physical well-being of the flock and says, here's what a good shepherd should be like, like me. So my point is that the work of the shepherd included keeping the sheep healthy. Ezekiel 34, 1 through 31, particularly verse 4. Also Zechariah eleven sixteen. 16. What I've been doing now for goodness knows, I have nine weeks, I think this is the 10th. I have been looking at one thing I have, been, I have observed every place I can in the Old Testament, every place, and in the New Testament, the work of shepherds. And I have looked at that work and categorized them to, into, into two clear categories. These are things that shepherds do that clearly are analogous to what elders as shepherds ought to do, and some of these things aren't. I have taken all of the things that I see that are clearly analogous things that literal physical shepherds were required to do and saying these things also spiritual shepherds are required to do and one of my responsibilities as an elder in a, a small local church i have the responsibility to do all that i can to help the believers that i've been placed in the midst of the shepherd to remain spiritually healthy and every elder does. And again, I'm hoping that as you see these things, you're, this will help you determine, is this elder really doing what he's supposed to do? Is he really an elder after God's own heart? Does he have my spiritual health, my spiritual well-being? Is that foremost in his mind? Is there a real concern for that? Or is he a wolf in sheep's clothing? care less about my spiritual health. His concern with is his own greed and other issues. But here, let me back this up and read it as a statement. Sorry. The work of the shepherd included keeping the sheep healthy. Elders have the responsibility of keeping believers spiritually healthy, which they are to do critical by teaching the word of God, the water and food sources of sound spiritual health. See, the word of God and is the water and food sources of sound spiritual health. The word of God, I can also tell you, is the bandage, bandage, what a band-aid for wrapping wounds and bringing healing. And they all sort of do this by exhorting believers to walk by faith, or to teach the word of God, which is the water and the food, spiritual food that believers need for spiritual health. We 
We are to exhort believers to walk by faith. We are to exhort believers to walk in accordance with the word of God. We are to exhort believers to walk, walk live life with a deep reverential awe for God, which we express to believers, how do you manifest a deep reverential awe for God? Is it by getting some solemn, somber look on your face, walking with your head, looking down to the ground like you're always sad? No, it's, it's by walking in obedience to the word. And this is a part of helping you maintain spiritual health is to rebuke believers for not doing so. And then elders have the work to restore to spiritual health believers who've been overtaken by a spiritual malady or maladies. And that involves normally sin. And again, we do this Elders do this by means of teaching the word of God. And that's a lot of passages and things to cover. I want to establish for you that the word of God, I called it, and here's why I call it, the water and food source that, be that believers need to maintain sound spiritual health. Well, if the word of God is the water, and the food source needed to maintain sound spiritual health. What must an elder do in order to help those whom he is shepherding maintain spiritual health? Teach the word of God. Bring to them the water and bring to them the food source that they need to maintain sound spiritual health. And I'm going to show you this from one passage, one passage only. Psalm 1. And I'm only going to do the first three verses of the psalm. We read in Psalm 1, blessed is the man. Notice I've got is bracketed. I do that when I'm looking at a nominal construction, which is a form of a Hebrew sentence that doesn't have a verb. And all that means is that what the Holy Spirit is trying to communicate is that this is a permanent, it is a fixed position. It, it's, it's welding two thoughts together, just like me taking my hands, lacing them together, and think about me putting some of the, the, the crazy Gorilla Glue into that thing. It's, you wouldn't separate them. You would have to go to the doctor to get them separated. That's the point. Bless it. This doesn't change. Fixed state. The fixed state of the man walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinner, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, the fixed state of that man, blessed. Verse two, but his delight, once again, nominal construction, his delight, fixed delight, permanent delight in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. Verse three, and he, this blessed man, the one whose fixed state is in the word of God, shall be like a tree. Notice where he's planted. Planted by the rivers of water that bring it forth its fruit. He's talking about the tree in its season. Its leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doth shall prosper. Now I'm going to walk back through this and add some color, uh, at least hopefully add some color. Uh, from the Hebrew text, the word blessed, translation of the word asher, I've got it right here, asher, and I'm not going to go through a, a bunch of places in the scripture, asher in this context denotes a person whose state of being, a person whose state of life is in what I call a very good place, and this, this person who is blessed, his state of life is one that is a grace-favored state. Uh, that's the best two words I can use for a share. A grace-favored state of being. That's what I mean by the word, what the text means by the word a share. Grace-favored state of being. Halach. That's the word walketh. It is literally does mean to walk, but the word is also used in the scripture figuratively. So to live life. So he's telling us that this person who lives in a grace favored state 
of life. This is first, he says, this is what he does not do. He does not live in the council of, well, here, I guess I put some uh, lexicons up to show that halach, the word literally means formally walk. In other words, go about doing certain actions in a regular, more or less consistent manner, so possibly constituting a life or lifestyle. And I, and I go beyond what uh, James Swanson does in the Dictionary of Biblical Languages with semantic domains. I put this beyond possibly. This denotes a lifestyle, and he is talking about a lifestyle. Now, the lifestyle of this man, he is not in the council. He doesn't get advice. He doesn't get his information. He, 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 he doesn't, his source for how to live life doesn't come from the ungodly. It doesn't come from the unbelieving world, which unfortunately, from my perspective today, this is where, particularly in our 24-hour day, constant bombardment of news cycle, I'd suggest turn the stinking news off because you're, what you're hearing is the counsel of the ungodly, that is men, women, who live their life alienated from and apart from God in the truth of his word. You don't need their advice on how to live life. And, and the grace favored man is one whose lifestyle is not based on drawing counsel from the ungodly nor standeth in the way of the sinner. Uh, I thought that needed a little help because nor standeth in the way of the sinner uh, doesn't mean that you're literally trying to block someone. A uh, standeth in the way of the sinner would not be, you would not, it doesn't mean that there's a, a line at the abortion clinic and you're you're standing in the way, you're, you're linked arm to arm to keep somebody from, from going in. That's not what is meant by standeth in the way here. <laughs> It doesn't mean if a person wants to become involved in, and I still think the best way to actively fight against abortion, I think, is try to bring people to repentance, a change of heart, mind concerning the gospel of Jesus Christ, to believe on him, and then to start growing in his word, and let the word inform that person. But that's a whole other issue. Here is how a translator's handbook on the Psalms uh, by Robert Bratcher uh, explains, not standard in the way, he does not follow the path taken or indicated by sinners, again, by those who, who live life alienated from God and apart from God and his word. See, the man whose life is blessed, the man who has a grace-favored life, does not follow the path of the unbeliever. He does not imitate the example of sinful people. And again, I would ask you, but look at the church today. Did we do that? I would point to one area I would point to. Look at music today. Uh, look at what's happening with, with, with music. Whose example are we following? We are supposed to be the trendsetters, not the followers. But that's been reversed. No wonder we find so few who that I would call are living a grace-favored life. Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinner, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, Scornful is the word let's that I have here on the screen. Let's literally means arrogant fools. At least that is how I define let's. Arrogant fools. And here are some reasons why. If you look at Proverbs 9, 8, 13, 1, and 19, 29, what you're going to find is you'll find the word let's, the Hebrew word let's, the word translated scornful here, set in contrast to a fool, okay? It's in contrast to a fool. So if it's in contrast to a fool, then let's is somebody who is not, a, somebody who is let's, he's a fool, he's a fool. And you'll also see it, it said as 
be, be uh, not set in contrast, but literally see it be translated as arrogant. So here is my readout on that word. When he talks about nor sitteth in the seat that is in the place of the position, he doesn't sit in the place of position, honor and, and uh, where there is counsel with arrogant fools. Doesn't do that, okay? The blessed won't go to the earthly wise. The blessed won't go to the earthly arrogant fools. They don't do that. That's not where, and he's repeating what he stated here in the first line about not walketh in the counsel of the ungodly. We're dealing with poetry, and this is re-emphasizing that truth concerning how the man who is a great, has a grace-favored lifestyle, he is a man who does not seek advice, does not seek counsel from, does not follow the way, nor does he sit in the seat of those who live life apart from God, without God, those who live life apart from God's word and the truth of the word of God. Those who do that, they're arrogant fools. Now to the positive, but his delight, notice again, we are looking at nominal construction. Delight is the word kepets. <laughs> no, dried throat. Kepets can mean desire. Delight is a proper translation. It can also denote pleasure. And I really think in the context, it's not just his delight. It's not just his delight. It is a delight filled with pleasure. His delightful pleasure in the law of the Lord. He takes delight and pleasure in the law of the Lord. And in the awe, he doth meditate day and night. And you can see these senses of chapets to denote desire and pleasure. Both words are there. And notice what he does in the second half. In his, and in his law, that is God, doth he ha-ha. Ha-ha, the word translated meditate, it literally means to growl like a lion, Isaiah 31, 4. Secondly, it also can be mean to coo like a dove. Uh, that's uh, Isaiah, and there's not a one in front of it, sorry, Isaiah 59, 11. It can also mean to mutter, uh, something I do often, uh, to myself in Job 27, 4, Isaiah 8, 10, and even to mutter to oneself out loud. And there is a reason for doing this. You haga to help commit to memory. Unfortunately, my oldest grandson uh, was never taught, and it makes me angry. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm angry at the educational system that does this to kids. Uh, teacher, whoever his teachers were, every one of you should be ashamed. They never taught him how to study. Never. Ridiculous nonsense. So when he wanted to get a contractor's license in the state of Arizona, and it is a very complex test, he came to me and he said, I got to take this test. Can, can you help me? No, son, I know nothing about what you're going to take test. I have no information about that. I'm horrible with anything to build. And then he said, no, I, how do I study for a test, grandfather? How do I study? And I explained to him how you study for a test. And from my perspective, relatively simple, you go through, uh, you, first of all, you read what you're supposed to be studying. You read it, you read it, you get an underline. Once you make sure that you have seen the uh, primary things that you know you have to know, you put those on three by five cards. And then you write the answer on the three by five card and you write the question on the reverse side of that card and you get your stack of cards. And what you do is you ask the question, flip it, you read the answer and you do it out loud. And why did I have him reading it out loud? Because my eyes are seeing it, my lips are speaking and my ears are hearing it. It helps you commit it to memory and you do it over and over and over and over again until you don't have to flip the card over for the answer because now you've got it committed to memory. 
that, how I helped him study. And yeah, he aced his, he did great on his test. And he's done a whole lot better with things from that point forward. Somebody should have told him all kids years ago. But here is how a critical and exegetical commentary on the book of Psalms defines chepetz, murmuring tone of one reading to oneself to impress it upon the memory and commit it to memory, a method characteristic of Oriental students. Well, if it's, it, it darn well should be a characteristic of Western students as well. It's a very good way to help you put things in memory. I still do it today, I, particularly right now. I do a lot of accounting work, I work with numbers. Uh, I have a real difficulty seeing six and eights, threes and fives, it's really hard for me to see, so I watch close. And what I do when I'm reading the numbers and I'm getting ready to key into the adding machine, if I'm looking over here at the thing and it says $135,320, I'm doing $135,325, $284.14. I'm seeing the numbers, I'm repeating the number out loud as I'm in keying it into my adding machine. Why? to help, hopefully help me get the right number in the machine. It is a way of helping commit something to learning. So this is what he's talking about to the psalmist. Notice, here's a concise Hebrew and Aramaic lexicon of the Old Testament by holiday. To read in an undertone, ponder by talking to oneself. And this is what he did with the word. The psalmist read and he talked to himself about the word. I would drive you nuts if you're in my study. So when I was going through, looking at the word, and I'm going through passages, I'm saying to myself out loud and I'm scribbling notes what the word means. Why? Because I'm trying to get it committed to memory. The same with blessed. I, I'm trying to commit to memory the thought that you're dealing, when you're dealing with this word, you're dealing with somebody who's been the recipient of favored grace or a grace favored recipient. You repeat and you repeat because you want it to be a part of your memory. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. His pleasure is to be in the word. And in his law, doth he mutter, he repeats to himself, he meditates, locks it in his memory, and he does this day and night. Now, I take day and night to be a metaphor, uh, as a part of a, a poem, but expressing a thought. He, he, this is consistent, concentrated study in careful deliberation of the word of God, something Joshua was exhorted to do and something every single believer in Jesus Christ ought to practice when it comes to the word. It shouldn't be just coming to listen to me or, or your elders and your church. Yeah, be there, please. Listen to them, uh, give heed, help them, support them in every way you can, your prayers, your presence, your, your, fit, your financial gifts, help them. But you have a responsibility. Go study yourself consistent, concentrated study and careful deliberation. It takes me a long time to put all those passages that you see after the uh, comments I make. I put them there for a reason, so that the people in my fellowship can, whether they do or not, I don't know. I urge them to, I exhort them to, I do the same to you. If you do or don't, that's not, my responsibility ends. So this is where it stops. To exhort you is all I can do. I can't put a gun to you, won't put a gun to your head, uh, won't try and force you, but I'm telling you, God wants you to consistently concentrate, carefully deliberate on the word, on the word that you're reading, the word that you're studying, and hopefully these passages I give help you do that. You see, for the psalmist, the study of the word of God was not a drag. I hear some people, oh, Bible study, oh, doctrine, how boring. We want to do something fun, exciting. <sighs> Become a psalmist. Take pleasure in the study of the word of God. It should be a drag to you. It should be like my dear 
darling friend over here. This is Penelope Pleasure. See, that's her delight. This dear woman, and I have a lady in mind when I use that picture. It, I'll just tell you her first name. Her first name is Isla. She's a delightful woman, a delightful woman who loves the study of the Word of God. I have another delightful woman who listens regularly uh, to the to these pod, whatever these things are, uh, and I've known her for years and years. That's her, and I hope you know who I'm talking about. That's you. You have utter delight. That's what we're supposed to have, and it's for that handful of people. It's for the Islas, and it's my friend D over here. Uh, those people that I study for and want to teach for. That's why I keep doing it. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth its fruit in its seasons. Its leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doth shall prosper. And now I've got to really go fast because I want you to see this. The psalmist uses a simile, okay? Shall be like. It's a figure of speech involving a comparison of one thing with another thing of a different kind. I mean, that is what he is doing here. And he is using a simile to make a statement. He uses a simile as a description because a simile is supposed to make something more emphatic. A simile is supposed to make something more vivid by means of the illustration. And what he is doing here, he is using a simile to express what the results of getting one's guidance. If one gets his or her guidance from the word of God, as opposed to the counsel, the thoughts, the ways of mankind living apart from God and apart from uh, the word of God, he, he is trying to show you by way of a picture, here's what the results will be. If you are one, the results of taking pleasure in the word of God, the one, uh, the results of meditating upon the word of God, the results of committing the word of God to your heart, to your memory, here's the results. This is what they will be, be. So here is the simile. He is comparing a healthy fruit tree with a man. And he's doing this to teach us what is needed for a believer to be spiritually healthy, okay? Now, the psalmist used the simile to make his statement, the description he uses more emphatic. He uses the simile uh, to vividly illustrate what the results of getting one's guidance for life from the word of God as opposed to the counsel, the thoughts, the ways of mankind living apart from God and his word. And then what the results of the constant, continual, careful, ongoing study of God's word with a view to understanding it, retaining it, will be for those who do it. This is what he's trying to illustrate. And this is what elders are supposed to help you do. And he shall be like, a tree planted by the rivers of water. That's what he's going to be like. That bringeth forth its fruit in its season. To quote those words. Its leaf also shall not wither. And whatsoever he doth shall prosper. That's what's going to happen to this man. Now, I've got about four observations. Four things for you to ponder from Psalm 1.3. First of all, the text says the tree is planted. I would like to give you a more accurate translated translation. Shathel, that is the word you see, and he shall be like a tree. Shathel, planted. It literally means to be transplanted. See, it wasn't always there. This, it wasn't always there, but he was transplanted there. Maybe you're listening and you've never been there. Well, you can be transplanted today, this moment. And prayerfully, you have already been transplanted because once you're transplanted, notice this is a participle form and that denotes a permanent fixed state. And he shall be like a tree that has been and permanently remains 
transplanted, fixed state, transplanted by the rivers of waters. And notice the rivers of water. Who's, who is the water? What is the water? What's the water? But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up to everlasting life. The water comes from Jesus. That's the source. John 7, 37. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. If you want water, you want to drink of water, you have to come to Jesus first. There isn't any way to drink of the rivers of the water apart from coming to Jesus. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his heart shall flow rivers of living water. You come to the source of the water so that you can take that source and that source then can flow through you and out from you. You have to come to Jesus. That is the starting point for water. And notice Revelation 22 at verse 1. And he showed me a river of water, clear as crystal, proceeding. Where does the water come from? Out of the throne of God and the Lamb. Just as the so well, this is where you got to go. You've got to go to the throne of God. You've got to go to the throne of Lamb. This is where the water comes from. There's no water apart from God. There's no water apart from in Jesus, in the midst of the street of it, and he's talking about our eternal state, heaven, and on either side, the, the, the new heavens, on either side of the river, tree of life, which bore 12 kinds of crops and yielded her crops every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing, brought healing of the nations, it's of the people. And notice where the tree of the tree is. It's on either side of the river. It's drawing from the river. It's the water from the river that enables the tree to bear crops. And that's what literally what the Greek text says, to, draw, to bear crops every month and for it to provide leaves that will bring healing. And where does this water come from? It comes from the throne of grace. It comes from God. Jesus is the source of the water, which gives the source of the water, which sustains the source of the water, which nurtures spiritual life. John 4, 15, John 7, 37, 38. And my time is getting tight. The word of God is spiritual water. If we want spiritual water that we need to remain spiritually healthy, just as sheep must, if sheep don't get water, sheep die. Just simple. They have to have water to maintain health. We have to have spiritual water to maintain spiritual health. Ephesians 5, 26, Titus 3, 5, compared with John 3, 5, James uh, 1, 18, 1 Peter 1, 23. Second, of the four things to ponder, the first is you've got to go to the source of the water. Two, the tree is planted close, close to the source of the water. So that should make the next thing obvious to us. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. That bringeth forth its fruit in season, its leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doth shall prosper. The Hebrew literally reads, it's by stream of waters. The word water, the Hebrew word is me'im. Me'im is the plural form of waters. This tree is planted by a place where there is an abundance of water. 
So we, to maintain spiritual health, and an elder to help you maintain spiritual health, has to keep you near a place where there is abundance of water. The abundance of water is his word. The abundance of water is his person. Note the tree is healthy. The tree is healthy. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth its fruit, it's bearing fruit, that's a sign of a healthy tree. In its season, and that's important, in its season doesn't mean it's always bringing forth fruit. In its season, I don't have time to de develop that. Think about that. That bringeth forth fruit in its season, its leaf also shall not wither. When a leaf does not wither, un particularly under the intensity of sun pressure, it's a healthy tree. It's healthy tree. And whatsoever he doth not, he doth shall prosper. What keeps the tree healthy, bringing forth fruit? It is close to the sources of water. And I've given you two sources. Source one is the Lord himself. You've got to stay near the source. Source two, the word of God. We've got to stay near the word. We've got to continue to drink from the word of God. And that's why elders have to continue to teach. Four, the person who does these things will prosper. And this I have to be sure to cover because it really breaks, it offends me and it hurts me to see this verse misused by some of the prosperity gospel. It says, and he shall be like a tree planted by the river of waters that bringeth forth its fruit in its season, its leaf also shall not wither, that shall maintain health, and whatsoever he doth shall prosper. Prosper is the translation of the word selach. Selach literally can, it can, can mean prosper. That's a proper translation. But it also can mean be successful. That is another translation. So, let me say this as I try and quickly finish. This context, the simile is liking a person to a healthy fruit bearing tree. Thus, the context demands that the prosperity of the person be viewed in terms of the person bringing forth fruit in its season. It has to be. What does prosperity mean? What does it mean to prosper? It means to bring forth fruit in a season, it means to maintain spiritual health. Even under pressure, the leaf doesn't wither, okay? Fruit is figurative language for deeds wrought by the Holy Spirit that glorify God. That's what fruit is. Fruit or prosperity, I'm sorry. That's what prosperity is. Prosperity isn't filling your checking account with gold, silver, and shekels. The prosperity that he is talking about is spiritual prosperity. Spiritual prosperity is bearing fruit in its season. That is deeds wrought by the power of God, the Holy Spirit, that glorify God. That's what he is speaking to. Now, to bear fruit, what do you have to do? A believer has to abide in Christ. He must abide in Christ. John 15, 18. Or 15, 8. I'm sorry, John 15, 8, not 18. In this is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. Uh, the thought process here is that you will prove you'll make manifest you will show that you are my disciples how do you make manifest that you're a disciple of jesus by bearing much fruit here notice here being filled with the fruits of righteousness and how are they which are by i got a dog on you i gotta move back quickly which are by jesus christ that's how we have them, the fruits of righteousness, which are through or by means of Jesus Christ unto the glory and the praise of God. How do you bear fruit? You have to abide in Christ because the fruits come through the working of Christ by means of God 
the Holy Spirit. And that's what the psalmist is talking about when he talks about you're prospering. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth its fruit in a season. Its leaf also does not wither. And whatsoever he doth, this is the word, <coughs> I'm trying to get it out with my mouth the way it is, asa, and asa has various senses, including to produce. And that is the right sense, I believe, in this passage. The word prosper, salach, also means to be useful. It means to be effective. And I think both of these words fit better in the context than prosper. So whatever he does will be useful. Whatever he does will be effective in what? In producing fruit. That when you're talking about shall prosper, you're talking about being useful to the Lord in producing fruit. And the believer who remains planted by, is transplanted, remains by the streams of waters, the rivers of waters. That is the one who will maintain spiritual health. It is therefore the responsibility of elders to, and you can see the word salah means to be useful to be good for by looking at these passages. And this comes from a dictionary of classical Hebrew revised, but these are verses where you can see this truth, this meaning of the word to be useful, to be good for something. Here's another holiday he takes the word salach and notice what he says, be strong, be effective, be powerful of ruach, the spirit, be of use, succeed be successful. And in the context of Psalms 1-3, it is to be useful in the bearing of fruit that glorifies God. That's what it means to prosper. And elders are to give you water to drink and food to eat from God's word, because it is the water of the word of God that helps you to maintain spiritual health. Now, having inverted last week and this week, last week I showed you it was the word that helped you maintain spiritual health from 1 Timothy chapter 4. Sorry, I flipped them, but that is what I did. This is what elders need to do. This is the responsibility of the elder as a shepherd. You, and you now, you must drink the water and you must eat the food of God's word to help you maintain spiritual health. The elder can bring it to you and he must bring it to you. And if he's not, find an elder who is. Find an elder who cares enough for you. See, God cares enough for you, is concerned enough for you. Not only did he have his son die for you, but he has provided you so that you might have spiritual life, but he has provided you with all the nutri nutrients, all the nutrition that you need to maintain spiritual health and to grow, if you will. What is the Wonder Bread commercial? Grow strong bones, grow strong spiritual bones from the word of God, from the water of the word of God. That will help you maintain spiritual health. And finally, and I will close with this, to sustain spiritual health, elders and believers alike must stay close, close to the Lord Christ. And we must stay very close in his word. Until we come together again, by the Lord's grace, may you continue to drink from the depth of the wells of the water that will give you and help you maintain vibrant, vigorous spiritual health through the one who came to give it to you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen until we meet again.